All right, well, I'll get started. Um, thank you all for giving me the opportunity to speak today. My name is Rahan Bhandari. I'm in the section of vascular medicine in the Department of Cardiovascular Medicine here at the Cleveland Clinic. Um, and I will be talking about our research that's been ongoing for about five months, um, entitled Platelets as Biosensors and Regulators of Metabolism and Lipedema. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention those two good-looking gentlemen sitting in the back there are my former bosses and section heads of vascular medicine, Dr. Jerry Bartholomew and Dr. Scott Cameron. All right, as you're all aware, uh, lipedema is a fibrotic loose connective tissue, typically of the lower extremities. Um, almost exclusively affects women, and there's some hypotheses as to why that may be, may be the case, but it's not entirely known why. Um, in many patients, it's due to fibrotic tissue that can be very painful and bothersome. One of the major issues that we see here with patients that we see in clinic is often the time to accurate diagnosis is very delayed, which results in prolonged pain and suffering for patients with lipedema. Um, as of now, there is no known medical therapy for lipedema. However, in select cases, um, lipedema reduction surgery may be employed. So one of the, the biggest challenges we have in vascular medicine, oftentimes we'll get patients referred to us for leg swelling, um, for no known etiology. And often it's difficult to tease apart the differences between patients with lipedema, lymphedema, or a combination of both called lipolipidema. As you can see here on the left, um, the pictures of lymphedema. Of course, many patients will have um, ankle cutoff signs or elbow cutoff signs, which you can clearly see in those two pictures there. Whereas in lymphedema, uh, one cardinal feature on physical exam that we see is a stemmer sign, or you can see um, thickness at the base of the second toe there. And often they will have swelling that does not cut off at the ankle, but actually goes over the top of the foot. Um, but in some cases, as in the last picture there, you can have a combination of both features. So teasing apart and accurately diagnosing these patients can be challenging. Here at the Cleveland Clinic, we do have a multidisciplinary lymphedema um, and lipedema center. And that includes, of course, Dr. Uh, Jerry Bartholomew, who's seen patients with lipedema here for many, many years, um, as well as Dr. Douglas Joseph, Dr. Megan McCarthy, Dr. Jeffrey Uma, and Dr. Michael Tran. The proposed pathway, which uh, we are hoping we can launch for these patients to ensure sort of comprehensive care, involves an initial evaluation in the vascular medicine section, um, and then either diagnosis or confirmation of a diagnosis of lipedema, and then really using a multimodal approach to both the medical and psychosocial aspects of lipedema care. So this involves uh, consultation with endocrinologists, potentially for um, weight management and nutrition strategies, Occupational therapy for um, manual decongestive lymphatic drainage therapy, which can be helpful in patients who have a combination of lymphedema and lipedema, um, as well as vibrotherapy, which has shown some benefits in pain symptoms with patients with lipedema. Uh, we, will, we are trying to establish a program with the integrative and functional medicine folks here as well, and then again, in select cases, there are some plastic surgeons here who will do lipedema reduction surgery. We actually are fortunate to see quite a few patients. Now, this is both lymph and lipedema, but over 2,000 patients here annually. So, of course, um, we've been talking about some of the diagnostic and therapeutic challenges in lipedema. Um, in the past year, of course, the, as uh, Dr. Eakin spoke about, the new guidelines for lipedema care in the United States were um, published, which goes a long way to helping educate others um, and uh, kind of raising awareness of the disease. Um, however, as you can see here is a picture of a patient, actually Dr. Bartholomew saw many years ago, um, who came into clinic, and uh, this is two weeks prior to her lipedema reduction surgery, the day of and post-op, um, had good, uh, good results with surgery. But the bigger issue, at least in our mind, is as of now, there's no medical treatment. The, the goal really would be to ameliorate symptoms and hopefully reduce the need for the surgery in the first place, or at least delay that. So one, um, myself with Dr. Cameron and Dr. Cameron's lab, we uh, study platelet biology. So a paper that was published in 2018 that really caught our eye um, in JCI Insight, which is a very reputable journal, um, was out of Stanford, um, a group with Stanley Roxon and Guillermo Oliver. Uh, they looked at a molecule called platelet factor four and actually found that it was a biomarker for lymphatic promoted diseases. And in that, they encompass both lymphedema and lipedema. So that caught our eye because platelet factor four is a platelet-specific biomarker, and it's actually released from activated platelets. And we know that platelets play 
many diverse roles um, in propagating thromboinflammatory responses, pain responses, and interact with adipose tissue, actually. So shown here on the right, oops, sorry. Shown here on the right, um, they essentially show that they can discriminate both lymphedema and lipedema from patients who do not have those disorders by looking at PF4 in the blood with relatively good sensitivity and specificity. So this is a schematic from the Lipedema Foundation. Um, and what we thought was interesting was there are many ways to look at um, the pathophysiology of lipedema. And as you see here, many of the components shown are some of the ways research is ongoing. But one thing that maybe not has, has not been looked at is the blood vasculature um, and the roles of, of platelets, specifically in the blood, potentially playing a role in patients with lipedema. And as we know, a little schematic here on both sides, Activated platelets release a number of chemokines and cytokines which can enhance or propagate inflammatory responses. So initially, and again, this research really started in October, November of this year. Uh, we've done a little bit of work, so uh, one thing we, we started with uh, was to try to validate whether platelet factor IV truly is elevated in patients with lipedema and or lymphedema. So, Shown here was some transcriptomic uh, sequencing, and you can see platelet factor IV um, to the left of that P is less than 0 0.05, means it's a significantly elevated in both lymphedema and lipedema patients. Moreover, uh, we actually have done some ELISAs looking at PF4 in the blood of these patients as well, and we can find that actually, in fact, PF4 is elevated in patients with lipedema. So this may serve as an adjunctive biomarker to help diagnose patients with lipedema earlier and potentially to track outcomes. And for us, most interestingly, really suggest, strongly suggest that platelets are activated in patients with lipedema. Therefore, they may uh, benefit from anti-platelet strategies. So there's a, no, a bunch of data because of time limitations I'm not showing, but we have characterized the platelet phenotype really in depth and it, it really does track with platelets from patients with lipedema having, being hyperactive to the traditional biochemical pathways that we think of. Another way to look at, um, look at uh, responses on these folks, and you know, of course, activated platelets, the thing we worry about is uh, blood clot formation, potentially. Um, but aside from the platelet itself, uh, there is the coagulation cascade, or a cascade of clotting factors, which sometimes can be deranged and increase the risk of blood clots. So we know that antiplatelet drugs here, um, by blocking platelets, can to some extent, attenuate those responses and potentially reduce thrombotic outcomes. But there are ways to look at the clotting cascade as well. Amongst those, there are a number of drugs we use in patients for, for various indications um, that are used to mitigate thrombotic responses. These include warfarin and heparins, factor 10A inhibitors like Eliquis or Xarelto, um, or excuse me, factor 10A inhibitors and direct thrombin inhibitors. Um, as well as patients who actually have a blood clot rarely will use TPA, which will actually destroy the blood clot itself. So one thing we're interested in is looking at, we've characterized the platelet and it seems to be hyperactive, but is the coagulation cascade also potentially changed in patients with lipedema? So one way to look at that is to look at both thrombin and fibrin dynamics. So to do this, uh, we actually, we collect blood real time from patients in clinic. We'll take it to our lab, we spin it down. From the spun down fraction, we can actually isolate plasma that is free of platelets, so only contains the coagulation clotting factors. And then we have this sort of nifty machine, which we, we can run the patient's plasma through, and it actually will provoke blood clots. And we can look at the dynamics of blood clotting generation in patients. Um, independent of their platelets. So one thing, a couple things we found that are really interesting is actually, in fact, thrombin generation, if you remember, was one of the key clotting uh, factors, um, is actually lower in lipedema compared to age gender-matched controls. This is interesting because we know that patients with lip lipedema actually do have bruising phenotype, um, and often less thrombin can lead to that phenotype, so this may be part of the reason why um, patients with lipedema are more, easy, are more prone to bruising. Oops, sorry. Similarly, we looked at thrombin generation. Although you'll see here, um, lipedema again, um, oops, sorry. There we go. 
Um, we also looked at clot density. So this is essentially how, how tight the clot that may be formed here ex vivo or in the lab um, in patients with lipedema is. And in some studies, they've looked at um, you know, clot density potentially being a surrogate factor for how amenable these blood clots are to treatment. Um, and we know that blood clots themselves are bioactive and can influence the arterial wall and venous walls. Um, and sometimes there's some literature showing that um, you know, persistent blood clots may cause long-term changes in the vasculature. So that's just sort of, again, a, a, a bit of a, of a snapshot of some of the research we're doing. It's ongoing, it's very exciting. I think uh, a lot of what we're finding is very consistent. Um, the research has only been possible through generous donation by the Lipedema Foundation. So we're very, very, very um, uh, glad to be a part of that and hope that we can repay their good faith. Um, Dr. Scott Cameron, again, who's in the back there, is the PI of our lab and section head in vascular medicine. Uh, myself there, uh, one of the members of the lab, as well as a new Uggerwall, who's a postdoc, Matthew Godwin, who's a research technician, Annalise Hamer, Akire Adameo, and Crystal Pasquale, who are both, all three med school bound next year, and Suman Guntapali, who is an undergraduate student working with us. So thank you all for giving me the chance to talk. I'd be happy to take any questions. There was a question of, are there platelets, are you able to identify platelets in Durkheim's disease? Very good question. Um, we can, I think part of the challenge is uh, Durkheim's disease is, we see it even more um, infrequently than patients with lipedema. So I think one of the challenges might be um, just capturing enough patients to actually make um, real observations. But absolutely, what we're doing here with lipedema could be done with Durkheim's as well. Okay, I have a very technical question. Since PF4 has no, um, Clinvar recognized variants, although T2DM is widely recognized as a de um, deregulation in PF. Let me let you read this one. This sure. one's very technical. <laughs> okay. So, since PF4 has no Clinvar recognized variants, although type 2 diabetes is widely recognized as dysregulation in PF4, and Malacard's lists 52 diseases and subcategories associated with PF4. How confident can we be that all healthy subjects in the trial had no underlying, kind of trails off there, but I suppose that means how confident can we be that the controls themselves do not have confounders or other things that may raise PF4? So one of the nice things is all of our controls that we collect here, um, we take detailed questionnaires, including their medical history. Um, so they're all matched to patients. Um, so if they had diabetes, we would match the same number in the cohort with lipedema. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thanks. I just want to